finally we are here and we are almost ready to you know start the event well on behalf of the goa you know journalists uh, i send a warm welcome to one and all uh well friends uh, this is our fourth series of behind the byline that we started uh, in june 2024 and i must say that this series the monthly series is really becoming popular not because uh, it is uh, you know initiative of uh, this executive committee but the love that you people show towards our you know senior veteran journalist and today you can see like this is the most you know compared to all three previous uh, uh, events this is the most you know highly attended event i think and still people are coming in okay this is uh, nothing but uh, your love for all uh well friends uh, today uh, we are celebrating paul ganandis like we call uh, him as a you know gentle giant of goa journalism <laughs> and with him we have vijay disuza again uh, you know both of them are so you know they are on similar lines <laughs> i did not explain <laughs> what it means uh well uh, i'll tell you a little about uh, this uh, series behind the byline series see the goa news journalist is the oldest union of journalists in the state of goa started by the in 1978 and today we have this union has really grown and today we have more than 400 members to be precise i think should be around 430 across three categories that is the associate ordinary and honorary so the problem is like you know the members having you know serial number from 1 to 100 they really doesn't know like the new entrance the membership number with 400 and above so there there's a lot of you know communication gap between our members so this thought just triggered during one of our executive committee meetings and we thought right by starting this series it will give a good platform to both the veteran journalists as well as the new entrants to communicate with each other to know each other and along with this if we do it you know on a public platform then we can include members of the general public also and the uh, the close friends of the concern uh, journalists concern that we are you know celebrating every month and to tell you frankly like this has really you know picked up and is becoming really popular today we have veteran journalist paul ganandis with us and we are going to celebrate him we are going to know you know a lot more about paul ganandis we are going to add a lot of things to our existing knowledge as far as paul is concerned right from his childhood days to his you know professional life to his family life is going to talk all out and to moderate this session we have none other than vijay disuza the editor of the wing times so i would like uh, you know uh, gauri and uh, other executive committee members marcus can please escort our dignitaries in the times member of goa news journalist pooja kalamkar to please come in front and present you know welcome our guest in the bouquet of flowers come 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 pe maashe
involved in Atlantis. Uh, everybody knows him. He's a legend in green journalism. He's uh, Goa State's uh, state government's first green journalist award winner. And he has over 40 years of experience behind him. And uh, Paul started his career with the West Coast Times in 1979. And uh, he had to, that stint was cut short because there was a worker's strike. And post that, Paul joined uh, a Roman uh, company publication called Nome and Boy. And uh, from there on, uh, Paul joined Herald. Uh, Paul joined Herald under Rajan Narayan uh, as a reporter from sub editor. <coughs> and from there, uh, Paul went on to join Bohemond uh, Times. And after a short stint there, he left for the uh, he left for Nomin Times. And after a year with the Nomin Times, Paul uh, has uh, after stint with Nomin Times, Paul returned to Bohemond Times, where he remained in 2008 when uh, Times of India launched in Goa. And that is when uh, I had the honor of working with Paul. I was just two years in, into the profession. And uh, I got to work with Paul since then. And uh, for a new and young journalist, Paul is like Paul is a school in green journalism. And uh, Paul's I learned a lot from Paul's narrative style. Uh, Paul has a very unique narrative style, and anybody who has read his reports knows that uh, you know whether it is a tree or turtle. Paul narrates it in such a way you can feel the subject talking to you. And Paul is someone who always goes on the ground. A journalist even today is after his retirement is a contributor with TOI. But still Paul, Paul is always going to the ground for his report. He is someone who works from the ground up. And uh, Paul is absolute obsessive about facts. So if you know, like if you have worked with Paul, you can see him like even at 10, 30, 11, he is someone who is really calling officers or he will be calling his sources to confirm his quotes and, uh, and facts. So uh, besides uh, besides journalism, Paul is like uh, few people know that Paul is a big sports enthusiast, and he continues to play football twice, twice or twice a week. Even now, he remains extremely active with the seniors uh, football group. So over to you. <laughs> Very upset, I would like to explain to the to last to the present of two things. For giving me the opportunity, I must say it's a privilege and honor to do it for. So, yes, already I'm the introduction. But uh, actually, there's a lot more to say, but since my mandate, you have to be in the room. One thing I would like to just add maybe one or two things. Also. He is uh, for us, for journalists. He is an authority in environment. Environmental journalism he is also a pioneer in it. Paul may disagree. The many things will not be very too humble to me. Yeah. So those who think and always down to a humble, simple, they work in the mind of the two different papers, Namin Times, the less time to be the one. So I think we will start. Oh yeah, before that, yes, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Thank you, Sia. Hello. 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 पहले स्वातेर आम देवरे करो मुन्टा हम गोवा यूनियन ऑफ जनरलिस्ट ऐसे सोचते कि त्याग मक्का संधि देने अंगा विचार बन पाए दूसरे हम सो राष्ट्रलक बाप नाइक प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ बुज इज माय वेरी गुड फ्रेंड एंड इट्स लाइक वी हैव बीन थ्रू थिक एंड थिन वी हैव मूव्ड टू डिफरेंट पार्ट्स ऑफ गोवा वेदर ऑन इन � we have explored the interiors and he has high respect for me. When this invitation was issued, I was surprised. He said, celebrate Paul Fernandez. I got a shock <laughs> because, <laughs> what to say? 
I would like to say that sometimes I feel I am just like a postman, a messenger. People sometimes come to us. Of course, I do my investigative reports. But uh, there is a lot more I could do. So that is why I feel I have not done enough. And I, I think there is some feedback from, you know, activists that he is not, not writing about some subjects. So in a way, I think they are right because environment is such a vast subject that you practically cannot cover everything. <coughs> there, there are definitely more subjects to write. So I feel a bit uh, awkward when, the, when this, uh, Raj said, celebrate Paul Fernandez. I, I think I could have done more. I could have, you know, activated myself as an activist as well. But uh, I thought I will associate myself more with uh, journalism because in mid-1990s, I remember, I joined some heritage activists and we were to do some, you know, I think we were to pursue some matter regarding some heritage issue. So, one colleague, okay. one colleague, Rajin Desai asked me, oh, you have become an activist as well. So, I was a bit taken by it. So, I said, it's better to stick to journalism. And from that day, I thought, okay, it's better to, you know, continue with journalism and not dabble in activism. Then, <coughs> and uh, in that sense, I have been working now with Nove Goin, Heron, Navin Times, Gomantak Times, and the Times of India. I have been given good space. I have been. I am lucky that I have been encouraged, and I think I am satisfied. I have done my bit, but. I could have done more. I am sad that, you know, if I was an activist, I could have done something about my village. But I couldn't do that. So I feel a sort of sadness. But uh, in journalism, you cannot be an activist. You have to keep within the policies of the paper. You have to write within the framework of those policies. Yeah. So, we'll I think now. we can start yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first question which obviously anyone would want to know is, how did you get into journalism? Yeah. But you come, originally you are from Sangye. Sangye. So, how did you get uh, During my school days, I developed a habit of reading books. And I used to read extensively. Novels, uh, not, most, not fiction, but I mean, not non-fiction, but novel stories, and I used to read voraciously. Then, during the last lap of my education in Sangeen, Miracle High School, I was uh, even reading more books than ever, and I thought, you know, I should become a novelist. So, and there was a principal, I mean, our headmaster, Philomen, Father Philomen de Costa, he was a very inspirational figure. And I think some of his brilliance rubbed off on us students, including me. So, <coughs> but uh, it's easy to say I want to become a novelist. One should have good stuff. You should have good characters, you know, to present in the novel. Uh, in the meantime, I passed my SSC and joined the college. In the college, you know, I had problems at home during that uh, phase of my life. And I had to drop out. So, that ambition, I thought, had to wait. And I thought of doing something in journalism. I thought it would be better to be, you know, to pursue to pursue my ambition to become a novelist by first becoming a, becoming a journalist. 
<clears throat> but uh, first I had to get a job to survive and I decided to go to Bombay because uh, I had no skills. I thought there is vast potential in Bombay to get jobs. So I went to Bombay and I had to do odd jobs. I couldn't get a job in journalism either because I had no skill in journalism. I had to be trained. So <clears throat> in the meantime, I was lucky. I got a job in some small uh, auto magazine called Auto Spark. And uh, I worked there for a few months, but my health uh, cracked up. I had to leave Bombay and come back to Goa. Again, I went back to Goa and then again I fell sick. In the meantime, when I returned to Goa, I got an opportunity to join West Coast Times. And there I joined as a proofreader. It was in 1979, I think. So that is how I had a toehold in journalism. I started as a proofreader. And then, as Gauri explained, rest, you know how it is. Yeah, well, yeah. Your <laughs> specialization is in environmental journalism. Yeah. So what made you take up environmental journalism? And, and uh, was it at the beginning only you took it up or much later? When did you? Yeah. Uh, in the first place, I consider myself lucky to have born in Sangay. This is a town in the Western Ghats, in the foothills of Sayadri, the Western Ghats. And it was a very beautiful place and I used to be inspired by the beauty of that place. From my school window, sorry, I keep forgetting to. From my school window, I could see the full beautiful range of Sayadris. And I used to feel very good. So, it, uh, so, so to say, I was, I developed a love for nature and that is how, you know, I think it served me in good state to do environmental stories. Secondly, the environment is a very vast subject. One can write about the bees, birds, insects, all natural elements. Then you can write about the findings, new findings, which are very exciting. You get to learn about biodiversity. The scope is very immense. After I joined Herald, that was my first proper job, but I didn't have much experience. So slowly, first I started with the routine. It was not that I started with environmental stories directly. I started doing the routine stories. I used to cover the court, police, and other uh, fields, various departments. I used to go to the various departments and do the routine stories. It was actually Norman Tantus who was very helpful and encouraging. Then I joined uh, Gumantak Times in 1992 and here I started slowly doing some environment stories and heritage stories. And, uh, but the bulk of my work in environment I did in the Times of India, where my editors also gave me good space. I'm very thankful to them. And, uh, <clears throat> but I give due credit to all the papers who, which, uh, which papers, I mean, the papers that helped me to shape my Career. Yeah. Yeah. So, how was the scene in environmental reporting when you started your career? 
in the in the decades past, mostly in the 1990s, there were fewer environmental violations, controversial projects, issues of pollution and violation of the environmental laws were less or I think they were not being highlighted because they were happening in remote places. There was also a lack of consciousness among the people. The environment was not as brittle as it is now and it was not as vulnerable as, as it is now. Now the greed has increased. Actually, it was Norman Dentus of the Herald who was doing a lot of environmental stories. And other papers, Navin Times, I don't remember, they were also doing occasionally. But uh, Norman Dentus was a very good writer and he was doing the environmental stories. Then among the issues that were cropping up occasionally, there were recurring problems related to mining, runoff from mining pits, pollution of water bodies, and mining being carried out below the ground level. There were also issues of Nylon 66, a Japanese project for retired person at Arambol. All these issues rocked Goa at that time. There was a project also to have golf courses. In this uh, Jagrut Vaikarachi Falls, they were in the forefront of a struggle to stop these projects and finally these projects were scrapped. Besides this, there were in incidents of tankers carrying ke uh, chemicals overturning landslides and natural calamities. In tourism sector, of course, it was a buzz, and there were issues of illegal constructions in violation of CRZ rules. And as Goa became more and more popular, there was destruction of sand dunes, then other violations. And on the riverfront, you are supposed to keep 100 meter setback. That was not being maintained. It was, yeah, if there were other cases, they did come into the limelight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From what we know, environmental reporting is not very easy. So, what is the problem which you encountered or faced while uh, reporting environmental issues? Yeah, one of the main problem is getting some experts on board to say something about a subject. Uh, there are not enough experts in Goa or they are unwilling to speak because they don't want to be in good books with the, they want to be in good books with the government. And uh, in case you get them on board and you quote them and later on it turns out to be a critical report they clamp, clamp up next time and they won't take your call. So this is one big problem in Goa. I think other reporters are also facing this problem like me. Generally obtaining information is very difficult because there are no statistics, no studies have been done. And you know, your report doesn't hold weight because you can't get any figures of the time. There are some research organizations like ICR and NIO. Sometimes they help you out with some good research. But of late, uh, I have noticed this is my personal opinion. The quantum of research has shown a decline because I think they don't have enough funds and the staffing pattern has also been affected because I think 
the administration has decided to streamline the in, in, uh, and in the finances. So these are some of the problems. For instance, now there are good uh, IMD story. I mean, weather stories, which you can do, getting the IMD to say something. I mean, to give you information. But I'm sure. Many of our colleagues here, they are complaining on their group, media group, and they ask for information, it is not given to them. I think they have a big problem, they don't have enough staff, they have to, they have many responsibilities. So, I used to uh, like doing these weather stories, now I find it very difficult to get information. I don't blame the IMD, but this is the reality. Why, why do you think the scope yeah. of reporting on environment issues is increasing recently? Because you will know this better than most of us. Yeah, I think uh, the coverage on climate, uh, this uh, environmental reporting has increased because of climate change issues. Uh, violations of the environmental laws has increased tremendously and we are seeing you know like uh, these extreme weather events are increasing you know, beyond even the projections it's quite frightful and I think at the rate this is happening it's going to be very bad in the near future I think so I can give you some examples of rainfall, extremely heavy rainfall which is happening or which has uh, occurred recently. In Panjim it rained, it rained 236 mm in 24 hours. In Old Boy it rained, oh sorry, no, no, no. Uh, the state average rainfall was 236 mm on a single day in a 24 hour phase. Pan Pan Panaji was sinking under 360.8 mm in 24 hours. Old Goa recorded 333.8 mm. As far as I know, a state average I have not seen go beyond 200. It is somewhere around 170 at the most, 180. But this time it went up about 200, 236. And uh, Penjim recorded uh, 360, 360.8. So now this is happening quite frequently. 200 mm is being recorded by many centers very frequently which is a warning signal. Then there are other instances I could go on and on. I have written stories like this is particular month is the hottest month of in three dec decades. July had the uh, at the maximum rainfall, or the, it was the wettest month, I think, in 124 years. Then, in winter, the minimum temperature doesn't go below 20 mm, I mean, 20 degrees Celsius. So, these are like instances which happen very frequently. Yeah. Now, what do you think of the coverage of environmental uh, issues in the media? Yeah, I think our local journalists have covered a lot of ground. They are doing more environment stories on various subjects. Some are doing very comprehensive reports, not just a brief ones, they are doing big reports on various, uh, covering all the aspects of a subject. This is very encouraging. 
and I think they should be encouraged by the editors. Sometimes what happens is we are saddled with routine. It has much to do with our circulation also and our ad revenue. We cannot employ too many people. But uh, I think somewhere we have to cover the environment and give short script to other issues, I mean routine things, give less attention to it, but cover the environment more. So that's it. Yeah, so you have not only covered environment, but various other issues like say heritage and many other issues. So uh, are there any subjects which are not been explored properly or not not explored at all by, by us, by journalists? Yeah. And you look back. Sorry, there are a lot of details, so I have to refer to this. Basically, there are issues of uh, some exotic fish species uh, like tilapia, African catfish. There are invasive plants and ants too. These, uh, these are issues you know, which we can explore. Unfortunately, there are no studies done researchers have not delved into these subjects. Then the Biodiversity Act also, I think there are not many stories coming out. And there are stories on heritage also that th those could be done as well because a lot of monuments are being neglected and there are constructions around the heritage monuments and very close uh, even uh, like uh, the distance is even 10, 20 meters. There is one Jain monument in Bandora, which is which is you know overshadowed by a big uh, a row of bungalows. So these are issues I think that should be covered by journalists. So in your over uh, four decades of career, mm -hmm. you must have written so many stories. You must have even forwarded how many stories you have written. So could you say, list out maybe three to four stories which are very impactful or something uh, which you thought, which you think uh, made a big impact in the state? Uh, I wouldn't say or rather I would say the stories I did were appreciated. It is for the people to judge whether they made impact. I would rather say they were appreciated. While in Herald I did a few stories. One that was appreciated was a how to series, how to get married, how to get your driving license. So that was one I did which I remember. There were others I don't remember now. After I joined uh, Gomantak Times, there was some talk about declaring other backward classes. And uh, I thought, I myself don't know, uh, you know, how these uh, backward classes are. I don't know their background. So I thought there must be some people also who don't know their background. And I thought of uh, in looking into this, I mean, getting more details about these communities. And I spoke to our editor, and Sandesh Prabhudesai was there. They said it would be a good idea. Ashwin Tombat was there. 
Then I think it was Gurudas Savard, whom I was interacting with. He said, there is one gentleman, Gajendra Uzgampar, who is now a practicing advocate. Uh, Savard Bob said he is knowledgeable about his backward communities. He has done some research. So I approached uh, Uzgampar and he was very cooperative. He gave me access to all his data. He, he helped me with the data. And uh, we went out in the field as well. We went to various places where these communities were living. And I got to learn about Gosavis, Telis, and Charis. So it was very exciting. That was one series. Then, uh, in Times of India, I did uh, quite a number of series on waste management, oil spill, and tar balls. That was one that went on for, I think, 30 days. My other colleagues also <laughs> also contributed to that, Vidya, Vidya is there, right? And uh, I wrote about uh, springs and water issues. Yeah. See, one question many times with even like students or even otherwise people ask you in this profession writing against, see you have done so much daringly against illegal uh, Construction, <laughs> CRZ violation. Did you get threats any time? Uh, no, I don't remember getting any threats. But uh, the officials who used to give the information, they would not appreciate it. If there was criticism about some department, I could just, you know, say goodbye to that department or that official. They would not open up again and give me information and this is very difficult because unless you get information from the department, the official version, it becomes difficult to come out with a story and you end up by saying all my, all the best efforts to contact the official could not bear fruit or something like that and finish up the story. So that is the problem. But when vital information is needed, even uh, this will not help. I mean, you have to kill the story. And uh, there was one occasion when one politician was really furious. Uh, I think it was the Kazan Land Board Bill that was passed in the House. And it pertained to the Komdat land because these uh, Kazan lands are in Komdat land. The land belongs to the Komdat and it is community land. So if the bill was passed and if, if it was implemented, the government would uh, retain control of the land and even farmers would have had to pay for the water. So the Komunidad leaders were upset and I think they also criticized. So I remember I wrote a report about this, quoting all the Komunidad representatives and leaders. And this politician was criticizing me among my fellow reporters. I was not present and he was not appreciative of the report. After a few days, the bill was scrapped. But I don't know, it must be also criticism from other quarters. So this is the kind of situation it is. No, maybe knowing him, knowing his nature, who will give him that? <laughs> yeah, one question which always comes to my mind, especially the youngsters who also want to know, is how are they are transition from typewriter to computers and, and now it is AI uh, era. So how is it? When I was working in the West Coast Times, uh, that time I was a proofreader. Our cubicle was on the ground floor, like where that part of the room is, and the linotype machines were being operated somewhere around this part of the room. 
and uh, the liner, the composers composed the matter on the linotype, and it came out in slugs with the letters, and it came out uh, column by column. They took it column by column. They put, uh, they tied it up. They put it on uh, sort of a platform. Then they applied ink to it, black ink. They put a paper and rolled over it with a paper and the column was printed on the paper. And it was brought to us for proofreading. We corrected the mistakes and it was referred back to for correction. And that is how column by column the page was made. And that is how that system worked. When uh, regarding the this uh, typewriters, we were working with ty on typewriters, typing our codes. It was a difficult job because we used to make mistakes. Sometimes we had to improve our reports. So we had to retype the whole thing again. And when computers came into the, I mean, into our domain, we were delighted. But quite often, or initially, what used to happen is we had typed a whole story on the screen. And after some time, we realized that the story has disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so we practically called the technician who came, who used to come running. I think this was the situation in the Navid times because it coincided with my uh, joining the Navid times. I think there it started. Mid 90s. Mid 90s. Mid -90s. Yeah. And uh, so back to work typing the same story. Or if lucky, the technician may have retrieved, retrieved it. <laughs> the, if we were lucky, the uh, this technician would retrieve it, otherwise we had to type it all over again. But this was for a short time. I think technology improved and uh, later on we were to, uh, able to adapt to it and also it was more comfortable and user friendly. But about AI, I have no idea. I retired four years back. Uh, or at least in yeah, 2019. Yeah, I don't know much about that. I remember one command had come something had to happen. The technician or the engineer would say, press F9, F10. <laughs> I don't know what it meant. <laughs> For a long time it was very common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So next question. Of, um, so you are one of the few journalists, probably only one, I don't know, who worked for a company, Romy Script. No, no, there are. There are. Who so joined, well no, 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 who joined uh, English. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there may be. Sanjeev worked for which paper? <coughs> Sanjeev worked for Sonapran, then he joined the Marathi paper, Naukraba. And I think there are many others. That's what about Raj? Uh, yeah. Raj worked for a good uh, here is one prime example. Yeah. He worked for Sonapran, Udari, and then Navinta. So I see Prabhu. Yeah, not in Romani. Not in Romani. So now my question is nothing to do with that, uh, it's basically just to know because within a short while it folded up, there were some issues, some difficulties which uh, now I am faced. Yeah. So since you were there and uh, like we don't know the real story, what really happened. So it would be good if you could throw some light on it. Yeah, this was a very unique paper that came out. Uh, all the company lovers, they gathered together and took out a Pad Yatra all over Goa to collect funds. And they went on foot to all the villages. It took them, I think, quite a long time. I don't know, four months, six months, I don't remember. And uh, one of them in the forefront was, I think, Comrade Christopher Fonseca. I think recall with him. So, Finally, they collected the funds and started the paper in Margaon. And uh, I joined it at a later stage, I think 1985. That time, 
it had covered some ground. It had already, I think, uh, was in existence for about three years. But it was not doing well because the ad revenue was very poor. No ads were coming. The government also was not giving them ads. And uh, I remember Comrade Fonseca even took out a mocha in Tianjin, demanding that the government release ads to the paper. But uh, you know there was no response from the government. I think they gave some ads for some time. And. Uh, but the uh, paper was always in dire straits. Uh, Gauri's uncle, by the way, was working with me, Prasad Malkanikar. And we were always uh, you know, in, in dire straits as far as our salaries were concerned. The 10th of every month was you know, the date when they would disperse the salaries. But around, say, 20th of the month, they would call, uh, call the staff and say, sorry, we'll give you 50% now and we'll let you know, we'll give you the rest later on. After 10 days, they would say, but at the end of the month, it wouldn't come. And the, by first, you know, somehow of the next month, they would get the money and release that part and then you don't know when the next uh, salary would come. So this was the sorry state of affairs. The other working conditions were also bad. Uh, the management could not get good accommodation. There was uh, a small uh, house in which we were functioning. And the composing was you know, done with, uh, it, is, it is hand composing. There was no machinery. And I remember there were two, three sub-editors along with me who were working in a shed outside the, that house. And if it rained, we would take all our things and run inside. So for the company movement, it was, when the paper folded up, it was a very bad setback for company movement because this paper had run for about four to five years but could not sustain itself and had to fold up. Many company lovers were very sad when the paper closed down. Okay, this question I nothing to be general. But when I joined, uh, when I was a cop reporter, I heard in the press room, used to meet in the press room, uh, some journalists used to call him Paul John. Later on, some uh, editor of one paper used to call him John Paul. So I don't know why they used to call him. Could you just explain it? I think Rico and other Pope's influence. Let's hear from. Yeah, yeah, I was confused with the Pope. I used to. I used to. Meaning, my byline was Paul Fernandez. I started uh, with that byline in Herald. Then one journalist friend told me, that's a common name. And I found that there were at least two prominent namesakes. One employee in the, I think, one of the departments, government departments. So I took, um, uh, I mean, I, I thought I should change my name. And I changed it to Paul John. Yeah, Paul John Fernandez. So, but you know, it didn't catch on with, the, with my colleagues. They thought it was John Paul, or it was it was the editor himself who started calling me John Paul because he was confusing it with the Pope. So, and it stuck. And despite my telling them I'm Paul John, Paul or Jose, they would not listen to me, or you know they preferred to call me John Paul, and it stuck there. And then I I think I dropped the this uh, Paul John Fernandez as a byline and I reverted back to Paul Fernandez and it has continued since. But if I meet those old colleagues, they still call me John Paul. <laughs> and Rajan Narayan Paul John. Yeah, Rajan Narayan too. Okay, Paul, uh, could you tell us about your hobbies? You know that you are a very good footballer, as you mentioned. 
there is only one winner what about others you can play no, no, about I'm football also say i'm, I'm football. a very good footballer no, no, that you know <laughs> <laughs> So yes, I am not a very good footballer, but I give my 100% when I am on the field. I run around too much, I think, because one of the seniors commented, Are down a kare, so down a kare. <laughs> so I think uh, sometimes it is not necessary, you have to take up the correct position. So, but I am enthusiastic and that is my mistake but the thing is i think i will have to cut down on football because i have lost quite a, you know i think i lost 10 kg not only because of football but uh, there were problems some health issues and since then i have not been able to gain the weight so i think that has to do with football Strangely, I will have to reduce. <laughs> what about your other hobbies? Other hobbies, I used to play, I used to like volleyball and badminton, but I have not played much these two games. So it's mostly football, as bones love fish, football and training in whatever order. <laughs> yeah, this, I think, no will be to add to it. Uh, whenever we used to have interns and we used to send them to Paul, yeah. Paul used to treat like when you are a very senior person, like the treatment they normally get is different, but they used to all be surprised that Paul being so senior is to treat them with a smile, guide them well. And would never even if they had to make some mistake, would not go for press conference, he used to still be very calm and cool. And uh, will not get angry. So what is that which makes you keeps you so cool? Because generally generally when we have big egos now. So he is one guy who is quite grounded. What I would like to say is when I began in the Herald, I think Rico had uh, there were there was some problem, you know, here. I think uh, what you call taken a break for some time, right? Is it right? Well, you know, I've always had problems, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, even from outside, Rico has been very encouraging. So, like that, when I joined Herald, uh, Norman Dantas, they were very helpful. I was very raw, and they helped me gain the requisite, or I learned the rudiments in the Herald. I went to Bhumantek Times, there also all those uh, senior Ashwin Tower, Sandesh, they were very encouraging. Navin Times, there also I, I did well and they were very encouraging. I was very lucky, I should say. In Times of India, of course, Rajiv Bora, Rajesh Menon and Sri Nivas, they have been very encouraging and you yourself, <laughs> so what I mean to say is I should also give back something because otherwise I would I, I don't know it would have been difficult and it is our duty to have this in turn because journalism is becoming you know I mean in the sense very few would like to take it up because of the stress the work hours the patient that you need. So it is our duty to make them comfortable and get more people into the field. So that's it. I think. Uh, I just want to make one mention. Mm -hmm. When I was just two, two or three years in the profession, nine times, I was told to. I was given a code bit suddenly, uh, and till then I had not. Uh, entered the precincts of any court, high court, lower court. You know. So I didn't know how to do it. So who saved me? Uh, Paul was the savior. He was already one of the, uh, one of his bits of uh, court reporting. So I used to go with him and other court reporters also used to be there. But he guided me actually. He showed me the nuances of court reporting. I think regarding court stories, no? 
uh, I think Arbenia was also covering it. She had just started covering. And but not when I. Ah, uh, okay, okay. She anyway, was also doing the court, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, taking inspiration from her, I also started uh, doing it. But I think, I think more extensively she got diverted to some other dish, I don't know. But uh, I used to uh, cover extensively, I used to get uh, environment stories, public interest litigations. That time Goa Foundation and some others were filing PILs. There were violations in CRZ. And because of tourism, there were more hotels. And these hotels were violating the rules while being built. Yeah. You know, you are a, like a model for many journalists. We just wanted to know from you, what are the qualities of a good journalist? From my personal experience, I would say, you should read more than you write. I think many people will say that. Experienced people, experienced journalists will say that. Because you get that creative touch, I mean, creative uh, flair from it. Then you can increase your knowledge. Whereas, uh, if you don't read, uh, you know, even say, news reports, you don't get the perspective. You have to have that background. You need to have that background to do good reports. So, reading, then you should have a nose for news. You should get the angle right. Or, you have to develop that sense of, like, what makes, what will make it, uh, you know, what will uh, appeal to the people or what sells, what will work. So that sense we have to get. And of course, you have to move around. If you go out in the field, you get more stories. What is your experience? Yeah, going out. I have been out with Raj on many trips. He himself knows how exciting it is. You get to meet more, I mean, you make new new friends, you get new sources, you take down the numbers and it will serve you in good state next time. When something happens in that village, you can just call them. They are just a call away. And one, leads, one thing leads to another. You go there for one story, but you can get three, four stories. Somehow it comes out, you know, but you should know what is the story. So, if you develop that ability, it is very good because you, if it is interesting, you know, ah, this is another story. So, it automatically comes to you. So, these are the things. I think this is the Yeah, I have also gone a few times, <laughs> not too many times. But something uh, very nice, I felt the fall. Like even uh, with Gauri used to be there with us sometimes Marcus. And we used to pick up Paul sometimes from Pilar or other things. But you may be surprised to know like what will be the landmark. Paul would tell us you come and search a place. You may think it's a marketplace, restaurant or a hotel. But not Paul remembers. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. All all related to tea. <laughs> Right now? Yeah, it's like Gauri will know it. Because it's Kota Mention. Yeah, it is next to Kota Mention. One day it was Kota Mention. And we were going. Murari was there. Murari is the witness for this. We are going and Paul said, Chiche Kode yo. We are asking everybody, Chiche Kode, Chiche Kode. Who is Chiche Kode? And everybody is like, Ah, I know this guy, I know this guy. But finally, when we reached, we had fight it only. And Maggie Paul, I love. Are And Taja Muka, I had only Potter mentioned. And Paul is saying, Chiche, Paul, you could have said Potter mentioned. And one more thing I want to add about Paul's love for football. 12 years, 13 years, I worked regularly with Paul. In the newsroom, actually, tempers fly high, but uh, Paul is like um, always calm, cool in the newsroom. 
But when you, if you have to see Paul Henry, you have to play football with him. <laughs> there was an internal uh, football tournament and uh, Paul was disputing a goal <laughs> with Marcos. <laughs> Paul, Paul just would have let it go. Till the time we went to office, Paul was like one and all about down. He's just still disputing the goal. I think the last no, I last thought is Kichekode, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with uh, what you say. My preference. That whole landmark is called Chichekode, by the way. It's not only me. And Kota mentioned it is not much. It's true. Uh, it's true, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, then this reminds me of another piece which you told me once, you know. I think you also asked me to do it because uh, I think you had heard about some some landmark in Salset, Javsara Swambo or something like that. So I thought uh, taking up Gauri's idea, I will do that piece. And luckily along the road from Karmana to Margaon, Karmana is my village and Newton is around, yeah. <laughs> So there were a number of such landmarks, all amusing. One is Kuma Gadi, Toilet Gadi. <laughs> so uh, the thing is, uh, there was a toilet over there during the pre-Portuguese era. And after, I think, liberation, it was converted into a, uh, this uh, bar. And so people called it Kuma Gadi. Kuma is, Kuma is in Kokni is toilet. Then, I think somewhere a little further, there was Devsara Tsombo. It was a very haunted place. And the entire people, I mean the entire villages, all the people along the villages, they knew that this was the haunted village, I mean the Ambo. And they used to, you know, feel afraid when they reached that place. And at night it was avoided like anything. But that was the only road through that, uh, through the village, only village, to go further to Kavilo Singh. It is said that some ghosts have been seen, been seen there. Then there was one place called Voltar. Voltar in Portuguese, I think yeah. now it's become a company word. Voltar is a turn. So in Benauli, there's a junction. One road takes you to Kolwa and one to Margaon. So that is another landmark. And there was one Boga wine. It's in there used to be dances being held there next to the well. And it is by the roadside in Benauli. So a lot of love marriages took place there, it seems. I mean, after the dances, so that name got stuck. So this is all about place names. Sorry? Rico is from Volta also. Ah, is from Volta. Rico is from Kalyanso Gaon. Foxes. <laughs> but there are no foxes now, no, Rico. Sorry, I must be boring you. <laughs> Actually, it must be me asking from silly questions. <laughs> so, okay, I'll end with the last question. What is your advice to young journalists? Oh, uh, yeah, before this, we can throw the door open. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 No, I think I have not said enough about the environment somewhere. I think we missed one question. Uh, Goa's environment is now very vulnerable. And I think young writers have to take this out. Uh, as you are aware, the rules have been tweaked. You know about the 39A, section 39A. So, and on the other hand, there are extreme weather events taking place more closely now than ever before. And there are enough warnings, but despite that, the government has not taken it. It is our job to, you know, awaken the government, sound the alarm, and also create awareness. 
because some disastrous things are being projected and they are likely to happen. One is this wadi will be flooded by, I mean, lot of low-lying areas will be flooded by 2030. Then there are going to be heat waves. So, as far as possible, we have to do our job. The young uh, writers or the journalists have to take up the gauntlet and start uh, doing these stories. I know they are doing it, but they should do more of these stories. Yeah. For just uh, to yeah. add to what you said, mm. the politics of reporting the environment. See, in the first case, environment stories are slow moving, so it's very hard to tell. Secondly, there was a cut-off point after liberalization when politics suddenly became unwelcome. I don't know, I felt it. Because all uh, environment pages closed down. For economic reasons. Thirdly, and the most important point, you almost said it, you know, where, see, the systems have broken down. Academia, which is supposed to produce critical knowledge, is stopped doing it, mm. by and large. And then we don't have a feeder channel. And this is also because of the politics of this whole situation. Now, politicians are there, they have a stake in the issue, a huge stake in the issue. And they are making sure that this doesn't happen. Where is autonomy in education? That's gone. So I'm saying, like, you know, how do you get a holistic picture of the full thing? It's, it's, it's a big struggle. There was a time when the environment suddenly became, uh, you know, an issue of interest. But now it's on the back burner. People feel it from the grassroots up. But I don't think there's a push from top, like, you know, say, Journalism Institute to teach environment, to come out with the environmental guides, to have seminars, which was there once upon a time. These are just some thoughts which are inspired by what you said. Uh, you meant to say um, conferences on environment, then training programs all have all dried up, no? Dried up, or even, mm -hmm. even yeah, from, that space is gone. Mm -hmm. That space is reduced. Now it's coming up because of the people dem people's demand. That's a different thing. Yeah. There's competition, we know it sells. Mm -hmm. That's a different push. No, I also feel that uh, research in environment also, science, it's drying up. I think you will agree with me. So, and on the other hand, as you know, a uh, lot of uh, projects at central level, they do not uh, take, I mean, they are not uh, fashioned in a way to minimize the damage. So, you know, it's a bit insensitive on the part of the government to not consider the environment because environment, uh, you know, it's a resource, you know. All the natural resources are there. And we are, and they are shrinking because of this. Okay, throw your questions to Paul. Any, anything, any simple, complex, whatever. Please don't ask tough questions <laughs> because I'm not an expert. I'll answer whatever I can. Yeah, I yeah. tell you when, uh, when I write anything about, like, you know, I feel that I have learned this reporting about uh, what you say, empathizing with your subject, like the way you write about turtles, you know, you say people, friends, or, you know, you uh, kind of generates an empathy for the subject, or uh, this things that you uh, pick up, like some trivia sort of, no, like you just explained, Kuma uh, Gadi and those type of things, or how origins of name happen, or those kind of things which are not uh, very obvious stories. So when I think of uh, those kind of stories, I learned it from you to write like stories which are not the obvious or hard hitting stories uh, or features. So uh, like it's very unusual to find that kind of uh, story space kind of like you know so is there anyone that you uh, gained that idea from like uh, these kind of offbeat kind of stories any particular i idea? think uh, it's a it's a gift from god nature whatever you call it because uh, when i had not joined journalism i remember somewhere in 19, mid 70s, I think. And uh, yeah, West Coast Times was, uh, you know, had been launched that time, but I was not in West Coast Times that time. It so happened, you know, in our village. Uh, the next day was the feast. 
and some villagers, including my father, they tried to catch a pig. But the pig was a very unusual one. He escaped, they could not catch him. Or they caught him, but he somehow escaped and it ran some five kilometers from Karmana. It ran towards the church and crossed the river and went to the other side. So, uh, my, uh, my father and the other villagers chased it because they wanted something for the fish next day. But uh, the pig ran ahead. They caught the ferry, but uh, by the time they reached there, the pig had reached somewhere else, God knows where. And they lost and they came back. So I thought this was a very interesting story. And I went and wrote uh, some points and gave it to Valmiki Palero. He polished it very nicely and it was carried in the uh, West Coast Times. Yeah. Then I worked as a correspondent for Navin Times when Mudalyar was there. And some very interesting things used to happen. I think uh, one hen had laid very unusual eggs they were the size of uh, grapes. <laughs> and, what, I think uh, Anab Shahi. I don't know what is Anab Shahi grapes. Yeah, the story came out like that. I didn't say Anab Shahi in my report, but uh, whoever edited that report said Anab Shahi grapes. I think they were slightly bigger or something. So no, no, they were small eggs. Yeah, yeah, small eggs, not bigger, bigger than, not outside. They were small eggs. So all these uh, you know, unusual things used to interest me. And that is how it, that interest developed and uh, I got that flair for uh, these offbeat stories. Yeah. Picking up the unusual, because even uh, Suresh Knight from uh, Kurchure was an expert at this. Yeah, but he wrote correct, a single correct. column on how uh, two snakes were fighting or meeting in the middle of the road and there was traffic jams on both sides. Yeah, then got a front page call. Uh, Norman also used to, uh, yeah, Norman he used to encourage these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, correct. Norman yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 You also mentioned about water sport. Ah, water sport. Water sport you mentioned. Yeah. A lot of stories of weather. What about yes, there was, I think, a video circulating somewhere. And I thought it would make a good story. But without Dr. Ramesh Kumar, I have to give credit to him. He is like a faculty member, <laughs> always very cooperative. So that is how all the other stories come out. Hailstones also, hailstones also, Shirada, hailstones in Shirada. Hailstones. Yeah, that is one climate change kind of thing, no? As you said, Hailstones cannot occur during winter, no? but uh, in that particular instance, there were hailstones, I think, in uh, Which year? February? Which year? Uh, about two years back. Yeah, two years back, 22, yeah. I think, 22. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Lot of weather stories, in unusual weather stories they wrote. Yeah. Yeah. But you have been the expert who has been helping us. Uh, yeah, you have worked with uh, normal characters and you have worked with Ashwin Thompson. Both of them well known for covering environmental stories. Uh, what would you have gained from these two different perspectives? Uh, yeah, when I worked with the normal characters, I won't remember now my memory is started fading. But uh, I remember I used to do cover up all these uh, violations, then controversial projects. So, uh, it did inspire me. Ashwini also used to do some, meaning I think he has not written uh, stories as much, but he used to cover it in his column, Tomcat, I think, you know, Tomcat, yeah. In a very witty way, he used to present uh, these environmental issues in that, and even uh, routine things. So, they did uh, help me. I mean, 
working with them helped me do environmental stories. I'm sorry, my oratory is not so good. Please bear with me. No, but I'm that piece kidding. that piece you wrote on Nove Goa. Yeah. As Ashwin used to himself say, a journalist's job is not to stand and talk but to sit and write. And in keeping with that motto, I think uh, you know, many of us write better than we talk. Your piece on Nove Goa, okay, which you did for that book we put together in black and white. Black and white. It's yeah. quite a classic piece. It's floating around on the internet. If you Google for Paul Fernandez and Nove Goa, I think and uh, Paul called it Nove Goa the roof caves in. The roof caves in. And he describes from the from from the Padyatra where people walked on hundred days Padyatra or something, and uh, which he mentioned that you know they were uh, they collected a lack of rupees, which was quite idealistic in those days. Crowd crowdfunding, the lack of rupees. It was, was a lot lack of, money. of rupees. No, I don't yeah. know the amount. He mentioned the lack of rupees. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of money, mm -hmm. but somehow keeping it together was a challenge. And I think maybe journalists should look in terms of media alternatives even today. It's not too late in the day. But that piece is a classic, you know, I think, because it captures that slice of history. Thank you. Paul, tell us something about your family. Do you think you have lived up to the expectation or you could have done something more? Or exceeded? Yeah. Or have, have they ever protested against your profession? They all protest. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Or, or were they very supportive? Um, no, my wife has been supportive, but uh, quite often she used to feel the, you know, pinch because she had to do all the running around. And now all this has come to after retirement. They <laughs> 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 come to haunt me. <laughs> like it is like with revenge. <laughs> Mario Cabral used to say, journalists and donkeys never retire. And I think we should keep that spirit, you know, because retirement is something that makes you feel old. Yeah, true. Uh, Paul? Yeah, please uh, sir. Can you compare your work with any other journalists? Sorry, I didn't hear. Can you compare your work with any other journalists anytime? No, no, no. Uh, no. In what sense you are saying? Meaning, could be uh, a sense that type of, of story, sense of competition, uh, could be on those lines. Yeah, not just competition. Like, I said, you have not done enough in this field. Ah, that means okay. No, if I said it in what sense? Uh, there are a lot of things happening, and I am not able to cover all these things. Uh, we have our limitations. So in that sense, I Although think. I want to say is, let me come in as a supposedly neutral bystander. I think Paul is not, see the default in journalism is political journalism. If you are growing up in life, you have to move towards politics. But Paul has been going off on a tangent and, and proudly so. Whether it's environment, heritage, I think his contribution to heritage is far more than environment. You know, and, and uh, he has carved a niche for himself in that sense. I, I don't think anyone has, has covered his issue so consistently and for so long, you know, of course, everyone has their beat. Gauri has done education, <coughs> many others have specialized. But in terms of heritage, I, I, I don't see anyone who has done so much. No, because these are niche issues, it's very easy to overlook them. Everyone is dancing after politics. We need to probably look at the... Yeah, in the I think, you know, uh, reporters have to be encouraged. What I feel is, as I said, because newspaper incomes are limited, no? uh, you only employ X number of reporters. They have to do everything. They have to cover routine. I am lucky, I think, because I got to do exclusive stories and whereas my colleagues were slogging in the field. No, 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 Paul, but you also pushed for it. See, no one asked you, the, all the papers you worked for didn't tell you to do heritage. You pushed for it because it was your passion. So I think it should come from the journalists themselves. The, the managements are not likely to say, oh, they are getting good stories, if you are using your time well, if you give the, your paper an edge over the competition. Right? It's, it's on you also. The onus is on you as an individual. Yeah, I think it is my love for nature and even heritage. 
Why and did why and did how did and did come about? In no, your it case, is, it is like natural heritage. <laughs> 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 I mean, man-made heritage. <laughs> Sorry, man-made heritage. <laughs> like, <clears throat> take the place like uh, Old Goa. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And if you look around, you feel disgusted because the neglect is so much. Successive governments have neglected Old Goa. It's really painful to see. Garages are very close to some monument. Restaurants have come up here, world-class monuments. So it's a sad state of affairs. I think writers should take up these issues. Why or not? Because usually that's the thing. Where you go senior, you, you tend to get the political beats. Yeah. So how do you? <laughs> no, that's why. How do you avoid it? That's why I say I'm lucky. I was not, you know, pushed to do those uh, to do the political stories. That's why I say I'm lucky. And I don't like politics much. That also was a factor. And I didn't have political acumen, like say Murari has, or even this uh, Vital Das Segre, Julio De Silva, all these fellows had some political acumen. They knew how to get political stories. I didn't have that neck at all in politics. And if you had to contest an election, you would have lost? I would have lost. Lost my deposit as well. <laughs> Sorry, sir. I said, but this knowledge in politics is better than most political reporters. Sorry? Your knowledge in politics is better than most political reporters. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have a perspective, I think, because I, I, I don't yeah, know. I'm speaking from my experience of Oh, okay. really? I, I, this is a surprise to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, agriculture is also a good subject. I mean, it is. It relates to our food security, you know. And now it is under threat. Uh, we get everything from Belgaum and other adjoining areas. What are we producing? That's very little. It's good that you know there are initiatives now. People like India, they are encouraging. And, uh, but uh, it has to be a collective effort. I think our bones uh, to think more seriously about this. But the problem is what? And this will be a problem of the climate change. All the fields will get flooded. Uh, as you can see, I'll give you one example. This uh, area from Chimbal, Mercedes, and Santa Cruz, and this side to Talegaon. Uh, in the year 19, 1888, I used to travel by bus to Harald Office. 1988. Since 1988. Yeah, 1988. I used to see the, from uh, Bamboli bypass, Kalapura, that side. That full thing was open. It was the expanse of fields. And when they, when it was time for harvesting, it uh, turned into a very golden brown hue. But now, if you see, it's all covered with mangroves. So this is because we, I mean, neglected agriculture due to various reasons. There was the problem of. Uh, labor imports, rise in labor imports, and everybody abandoned agriculture. So
so uh, uh, the, the problem is what because of uh, part of being constructed in that whole uh, row of buildings and bus stand that was a field earlier that led to the displacement of water huge quantities of water and now can you see some places permanently flooded they are permanently flooded that is because of the displacement of water what will happen in future is when this kadamba plateau is stripped of all the greenery the runoffs will increase and the area of submergence which you see now that will also increase in this connection i would like to ask marcos because you live in that band area no below the uh, that monwal uh, lake that area was never flooded am i right recently i passed that side that area seemed to be like a permanently flooded area in summer i don't know but at least part of it gets permanently flooded no yeah especially in these trips from the river yeah so like this the areas of common uh, this permanent water logging will increase and agriculture will have to be ruled out because uh, it won't be possible to grow anything in this area and the projection of isro in Uh, they say in 2030 uh, all these low lying areas will go totally under water and i think even roads will be under water so it's going to be a big problem and areas of agriculture will the cultivable areas will decrease yeah all so sarayalo ka walkata bhi to thanda shant उदका <laughs> 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 because my memory is getting huh? you know, my memory is fading now this brain is having text to go <laughs> chasing kenna sir kon se bhai lagna don't remember kenna sir na lost cut bro na ek ek incident tha sir i don't know the uh, gauri is witness to that <laughs> paul aa gaya last time see paul i think paul had you know fired one story so this is story i don't remember लाइक They were greeting Paul like, "Oh, thank you very much." <laughs> Please let us know. We'll be more than happy to you know, help you. So, what was that? You know, what did you do to them? What did you do to them? Like, 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 what did you do to them? he altered the you know something around the monument that is the fort they had to do some amendment to do that which they didn't do i think the government later on did something to correct that uh, so he was angry about it and then uh, i carried a clarification about that and he was happy and i, I gave more information about the whole subject so he was happy about it yeah jawab not answer no all but to murari's question oh, you you all went on some you all were taken by some activist i don't remember where it is but later frankie told me that uh, journalists were like getting agitated about it and Oh, Paul, got, you got angry, right? 
and you told them you are a journalist. Generally, these uh, stories related to natural elements, they are the ones I feel satisfied about doing. Out of the blue, I, uh, there was a finding about uh, shellfish in Kelosi. They, they look like chocolates. The color and the, you know, the texture, it, I thought it looked like it's chocolate. Rajesh, I think, was around no, that time. Yeah, it was It was carried on the front page as an anchor piece. If you had to do a book, what would it be on? At this stage? Yeah, I am asked this question. Uh, Raj, for instance, occasionally asks me, when are you writing a book? So what's your answer? But sad to say, I have, uh, you know, exhausted my patience <laughs> <laughs> and I am not thinking of writing a book as such. Maybe Frederick, sir, can help Paul in this. 
I think Everyone that could be the because, most positive outcome of this session. Everyone has a book in their mind, not yeah. because I'm in the trade, but you know, I think they have stories to tell. Right? And we are looking at a ghost writer. <laughs> <laughs> but what I advise is don't put compile the papers together, though I have done it myself. Compile mm -hmm. articles. That's the worst option. Okay. It's a hurried option, but it doesn't work. Okay. I've done it myself. Doesn't work. Because the time has passed. Now unless you can explain the context. Okay. Even that works. Go beyond it. what is written and add to it. I to explain the context because the situation has changed. Timbley did it quite well recently. Mm -hmm. Sorry, who did? Prabhakar Timbley. Ah, Timbley, okay. But he's given the From context. From his column. Yeah, 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 his column. Okay. Newspaper writing doesn't stand the test. Mostly, mostly. Mm -hmm. It's better if it's your first trip of being a novelist. Mm -hmm. Like a Paul always wanted to be a novelist. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have the, what shall we say, I won't be able to write an hour at this stage. No, but there's too much writing in the world of fiction happening in Goa, Kokni, Marathi especially. Who will produce the ideas in non-fiction? Which is harder work but more useful from a societal point of view. I think. Tell me if I'm wrong. Even translations, for example, with your multilingual skills or something, but knowledge, getting knowledge in the market. Useful knowledge. You can think of writing in Kokani. Sorry? You can think of writing in Kokani. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, I mean, that's a good question, actually. I feel pain that I have devoted so much time to writing on the environment and I wanted to write in company but I'm sorry I have done nothing. I really feel sad. I have been to Kochi where there are a lot of bones who have migrated, company is picking uh, bones who have migrated there. Then uh, there are areas in Karnataka where there are company speaking people. So these are very interesting things. And company, there are a lot of things which could be written, but uh, it's so sad I don't get time to. I don't know, meaning, I have not, I don't get time to write in company, even for Gulab. I feel sorry I don't get time to write for Gulab or articles. I could write uh, something on the environment for them, but there's no time. Last, last question. Hey, what is your last two? Yeah. No, I don't get time. I'm sorry if I have bored you, I'm not a good speaker. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Okay, thank you Paul and thank you Vijay. That was a really motivational session. And I think also this is a you know session to motivate and to get motivated. And thank you Paul, thank you Vijay. It was really you know, inspiring you, and you know, highly educating also. Thank you very much. Uh, well, friends, uh, we have made small bookmarks here, and I think everyone must have got. So, if you if you are, if you want, and I would humbly request you to kindly get it signed from Paul and keep it as a you know oh my God. as a you know <laughs> as a wonderful <laughs> memory of this session, and which we are going to you know do it for the next sessions also. We started with Paul, and it will continue. Do it still. I would like to especially thank, uh, you know, I would like, like to acknowledge few people here who have come especially, you know, not for nothing else but for you know, for, uh, first of all, uh, let me acknowledge the presence of Times of India editor Rajesh Menon, okay, then, uh, you know, uh, Vinyal Pranendra sir is there, then our very own scientist, Ramesh Kumar is there. Mr. Madhu Gamkar. Yeah, Madhu Gamkar. He is an environmentalist from... From Kandola, no? Yeah. Then Gangaram Amre sir is there. Then Sadiq Narona, of course, he is a regular, you know, attendee of this 
My signature is very big one, simple. Big one, big one. My signature is so very that I can forge it someday. Bank, bank, a bank signature. Finally, we are here, and we are almost ready to, you know, start the event. Well, on behalf of the Goa Mineral Journalist, you know, I extend a warm welcome to one and all. Uh, well, friends, uh, this is our fourth series of Behind the Byline that we started uh, in June. 2024, and I must say that this series, the monthly series, is really becoming popular. Not because uh, it is, uh, you know, initiative of uh, this executive committee, but the love that you people show towards our, you know, senior veteran journalists. And today you can see, like, this is the most, you know, compared to all three previous uh, uh, events, this is the most. You know, highly attended event, I think. Instead, people are coming in. Okay, this is uh, nothing but uh, your love for all. Uh, well, friends, uh, today uh, we are celebrating Paul Ganandis, like we call uh, him as a you know, gentle giant of Goa journalism. <laughs> and with him, we have Vijay Bissuja. Again, uh, you know, both of them are so, you know, they are on similar lines. <laughs> I did not explain what it means. Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you a little about uh, this uh, series, Behind the Byline series. See, the Goa News Journalist is the oldest union of journalists in the state of Goa, started in 1978. And today we have, this union has really grown, and today we have more than 400 members. To be precise, I think should be around 430 across three categories. That is the associate, ordinary, and honorary. So the problem is like you know the members having you know serial number from one to hundred. They really doesn't know like the new entrance, the membership number with 400 and above. So there, there's a lot of you know communication gap between our members. So this thought just triggered during one of our executive committee meetings and we thought like by starting this series it will give a good platform to both the veteran journalists as well as the new entrants to communicate with each other, to know each other. And along with this, if we do it you know, on a public platform, then we can include members of the general public also and the, uh, the close friends of the Concern, uh, journalist concern that we are you know, celebrating every month. And to tell you frankly, like this has really you know picked up and it's becoming really popular. Today we have veteran journalist Paul Fernandez with us. We are going to celebrate him. We are going to know you know a lot more about Paul Fernandez. We are going to add a lot of things to our existing knowledge as far as Paul is concerned. Right from his childhood days to his you know, professional life, to his family life, he's going to talk all out. And to moderate this session, we have none other than Vijay Dissuza, the editor of Loving Times. So I would like, uh, you know, uh, Gauri 
and uh, other executive committee members, Marcos, can please escort our uh, dignitaries in the dais. And I would like to request a uh, you know, fresh member of Royal Royal Jewelleries, Pooja Kalambutkar, to please come in front and present, you know, welcome our guest in the Bouquet of Flowers. Come, 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 come. Okay. 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 Yeah, so those who think and always down to work, humble, simple, they work 
विजय डिजा एक परवानगी घता क्या सुरू कर आधी मैं एक दोन उतर सामू जाए पैले सुर हम दे बरें करूँ मटा गोवा यूनियन ऑफ जर्नलिस्ट ये संस्थे क्या संधि दी हंगा विचार मानपा दुसरे हम राजतेल बाब नाइक प्रेजिडेंट ऑफ भूज इज माय वेरी गुड फ्रेंड एंड इट्स लाइक वी हैव बीन थ्रू थिंक एंड थीन वी हैव मूव टू डिफरेंट पार्ट्स ऑफ गोवा वेदर ऑन इन ए कैब और ऑन ए बाइक वी हैव एक्सप्लोर द इंटीरियर्स एंड ही हैज हाई रिस्पेक्ट फॉर मी वेन दिस इन्विटेशन वॉज इशूड आई वॉज सरप्राइज ही सैड सेलिब्रेट पॉल फिनेटिस I got a shock <laughs> because <laughs> what to say I would like to say that sometimes I feel I am just like a postman a messenger people sometimes come to us of course I do my investigative reports but uh, there is lot more I could do so that is why I feel I have not done enough and i i think there is some feedback from you know activists that he is not not writing about some subjects so in a way i think they are right because environment is such a vast subject that you practically cannot cover everything <coughs> there there are definitely more subjects to write so i feel a bit uh, awkward when this, when this, uh, raj said celebrate paul fernandez i i think i could have done more i could have you know activated myself as an activist as well but uh, i thought i will associate myself more with uh, journalism because in mid 1990s i remember i joined some heritage activists and we were to do some you know i think we were to pursue some matter regarding some heritage issue so one colleague okay one colleague rajin desai asked me oh you have become an activist as well so i was a bit taken by so i said it's better to stick to journalism and from that day i thought okay it's better to you know continue in journalism and not dabble in activism then <coughs> and uh, in that sense i have been working now with nove goin heron navin times gomantak times and the times of india i have been given good space i have been i'm lucky that i have been encouraged and i think i'm satisfied i have done my bit but i could have done more i'm sad that you know if i was an activist i could have done something about my village but i couldn't do that so i feel a sort of sadness but uh, in journalism you cannot be an activist you have to keep within the policies of the paper we have to write within the framework of those policies yeah so i think we can start now yeah yeah uh, the first question which obviously anyone would want to know is how did you get into journalism yeah but you come originally you are from sangin sangin so how did you get uh, during my school days i developed a habit of reading books and i used to read extensively novels uh, not most not fiction but i mean not non fiction but novel stories and i used to read voraciously 
Then, during the last lap of my education in Sangin, Miracle High School, I was uh, even reading more books than ever. And I thought, you know, I should become a novelist. So, and there was a principal, I mean, our headmaster, Philomen, Father Philomen de Costa, he was a very inspirational figure. And I think some of his brilliance rubbed off on us students, including me. So, <coughs> But uh, it's easy to say I want to become a novelist. One should have good stuff. You should have good characters, you know, to present in the novel. Uh, in the meantime, I passed my SSC and joined the college. In the college, you know, I had problems at home during that phase of my life. And I had to drop out. So, that ambition I thought had to wait and I thought of doing something in journalism I thought it would be better to be you know to pursue to pursue my ambition to become a novelist by first becoming a, becoming a journalist <coughs> but uh, first I had to get a job to survive and I decided to go to Bombay because uh, I had no skills, I thought there's vast potential in Bombay to get jobs. So I went to Bombay and I had to do odd jobs. I couldn't get a job in journalism either because I had no skill in journalism, I had to be trained. So <clears throat> in the meantime, I was lucky, I got a job in some small uh, auto magazine called Auto Spark, and uh, I worked there for a few months, but my health uh, cracked up. I had to leave Bombay and come back to Goa. Again I went back to Goa and then again I fell sick. In the meantime, when I returned to Goa, I got an opportunity to join West Coast Times, and there I joined as a proofreader. It was in 1979, I think. So that is how I had a toehold in journalism. I started as a proofreader. And then, as Gauri explained, rest, you know how it is. Yeah, well, yeah. your <laughs> specialization is in environmental journalism. Yeah. So what made you take up environmental journalism? And, and, uh, was it at the beginning only you took it up or much later? Yeah. Uh, in the first place, I consider myself lucky to have born in Sangay. This is a town in the Western Ghats, in the foothills of Sayadri, in the Western Ghats. And it was a very beautiful place, and I used to be inspired by the beauty of that place. From my school window, Sorry, I keep forgetting to. From my school window, I could see the full, beautiful range of Sayadris. And I used to feel very good. So, it, so, so to say, I was, I developed a love for nature and that is how, you know, I think it served me in good state to do environmental stories. Secondly, the environment is a very vast subject. One can write about the bees, birds, insects, all natural elements. Then you can write about the findings, new findings, which are very exciting. You get to learn about biodiversity. The scope is very immense. After I joined Herald, that was my first proper job, but I didn't have much experience. So slowly, 
first I started with the routine. It was not that I started with environmental stories directly. I started doing the routine stories. I used to cover the court, police, and other uh, fields, various departments. I used to go to the various departments and do the routine stories. It was actually Norman Dentus who was very helpful and encouraging. Then I joined uh, Gumantak Times in 1992 and here I started slowly doing some environment stories and heritage stories. And, uh, but the bulk of my work in environment I did in the Times of India where my editors also gave me good space. I am very thankful to them. And, uh, <clears throat> but I give due credit to all the papers who, which, uh, which papers, I mean, the papers that helped me to shape my career. Yeah. yeah. So, how is the scene in environmental reporting when you started your career? In, in the decades past, mostly in the 1990s, there were fewer environmental violations. Controversial projects, issues of pollution and violation of the environmental laws were less. Or I think they were not being highlighted because they were happening in remote places. There was also a lack of consciousness among the people. The environment was not as brittle as it is now and it was not as vulnerable as, as it is now. Now the greed has increased. Actually it was Norman Dentus of the Herald who was doing a lot of environmental stories. And other papers, Navin Times, I don't remember, they were also doing occasionally. But uh, Norman Dentus was a very good writer and he was doing the environmental stories. Then among the issues that were cropping up occasionally, there were recurring problems related to mining, runoff from mining pits, pollution of water bodies, and mining being carried out below the ground level. There were also issues of Nylon 66, a Japanese project for a retired person at Arambol. All these issues rocked Goa at that time. There was a project also to have golf courses. In this uh, Jagrut Vaikarachi Falls, they were in the forefront of a struggle to stop these projects and finally these projects were scrapped. Besides this, there were in incidents of tankers carrying uh, chemicals overturning landslides and natural calamities. In tourism sector, of course, it was a buzz and there were issues of illegal constructions in violation of CRZ rules. And as Goa became more and more popular, there was destruction of sand dunes, then other violations. And on the riverfront, you are supposed to keep 100 meter setback. That was not being maintained. It was. Yeah, if there were other cases, they did come into the limelight. Yeah. <coughs> From what we know, environmental reporting is not very easy. So, what are the problems which you encountered or faced while uh, reporting environmental issues? Yeah, one of the main problems is getting some experts on board to say something about a subject. There are not enough 
experts in Goa or they are unwilling to speak because they don't want to be in good books with the they want to be in good books with the government and uh, in case you get them on board and you quote them and later on it turns out to be a critical report they clamp clamp up next time and they won't take your call so this is one big problem in goa i think other reporters are also facing this problem like me generally obtaining information is very difficult because there are no statistics no studies have been done and you know your report doesn't hold weight because you can't get any figures of the time there are some research organization like icr and nio sometimes they help you out with some good research but of late uh, i have noticed this is my personal opinion the quantum of research has shown a decline because i think they don't have enough funds and the staffing pattern has also been affected because i think the administration has decided to streamline the in in uh, and in the finances so these are some of the problems for instance now there are good uh, imd story i mean weather stories which you can do getting the imd to say something i mean to give you information but i'm sure many of our colleagues here they are complaining on their group media group and they ask for information it is not given to them i think they have a big problem they don't have enough staff they have to they have many responsibilities so i used to uh, like doing these weather stories now i find it very difficult to get information i don't blame the imd but this is the reality now why why do you think the scope of yeah. reporting on environment issues Listen, you will know yeah, this better than most of us. Yeah, once. Yeah, so some light on this. Yeah, I think uh, the coverage on climate, uh, this uh, environmental reporting, has increased because of climate change issues. Uh, violations of the environmental laws has increased tremendously, and we are seeing. you know like uh, these extreme weather events are increasing you know, beyond even the projections it's quite frightful and i think at the rate this is happening it's going to be very bad in the near future i think so i can give you some examples of rainfall extremely heavy rainfall which is happening or which has uh, occurred recently in panjim it rained okay it rained 236 mm in 24 hours in old goa it rained oh sorry no no uh, the state average rainfall was 236 mm on a single day in a 24 hour days then panch panaji was sinking under 360.8 mm in 24 hours old goa recorded 333.8 mm as far as i know a state average i have not seen go beyond 200 it is somewhere around 170 at the most 180 but this time it went up to about 200 236 and uh, Panjim recorded uh, 360, 360.8. So now this is happening quite frequently. 200 mm is being recorded by many centers very frequently. 
which is a warning signal. Then there are other instances I could go on and on. I have written stories like this is particular month is the hottest month of in three dec decades. July had the, had the maximum rainfall or the, it was the wettest month I think in 124 years. Then in winter the minimum temperature doesn't go below 20 mm, I mean 20 degrees Celsius. So these are like instances which happen very frequently. Yeah. Now what do you think of the coverage of environmental uh, issues in the media? Yeah, I think our local journalists have covered a lot of ground. They are doing more environment stories on various subjects. Some are doing very comprehensive reports, not just uh, brief ones, they are doing big reports on various, uh, covering all the aspects of a subject. This is very encouraging and I think they should be encouraged by the editors. Sometimes what happens is we are saddled with routine. It has much to do with our circulation also and our ad revenue. We cannot employ too many people. But uh, I think somewhere we have to cover the environment and give short shrift to other issues, I mean routine things, give less attention to it, but cover the environment more. So that's it. Yeah, so you have not only covered environment, but various other issues like say heritage and many other issues. So uh, are there any subjects which are not been explored properly or not not explored at all by us, by journalists? Yeah. Can you look back? Sorry, there are a lot of details, so I have to refer to this. Basically, there are issues of uh, some exotic fish species uh, like tilapia, African catfish. There are invasive plants and ants too. These, uh, these are issues you know, which we can explore. Unfortunately, there are no studies done researchers have not delved into these subjects. Then the Biodiversity Act also, I think there are not many stories coming out. And there are stories on heritage also that th those could be done as well because a lot of monuments have been neglected and there are constructions around the heritage monuments and very close uh, even uh, like uh, the distance is even 10, 20 meters. There is one Jain monument in Pandora, which is which is you know overshadowed by a big uh, a row of bang bungalows. So these are issues I think that should be covered by journalists. So in your over uh, four decades of career, mm -hmm. you must have written so many stories. You must must have even forwarded how many stories you have written. So could you say list out maybe three to four stories which are very impactful, or something uh, which you thought, uh, which you think uh, made a big impact in the state? Yeah, uh, 
I wouldn't say, or rather I would say, the stories I did were appreciated. It is for the people to judge whether they made impact. I would rather say they were appreciated. While in Herald, I did a few stories. One that was appreciated was a how to series, how to get married, how to uh, get your driving license. So that was one I did which I remember. There were others I, I don't remember now. After I joined uh, Gomantak Times, there was some talk about declaring other backward classes and uh, I thought I myself don't know, uh, you know how these uh, backward classes are. I don't know their background. So I thought there must be some people also who don't know their background. And I thought of uh, in looking into this, I mean, getting more details about these communities. And I spoke to our editor and Sandesh Prabhu Desai was there. They said it would be a good idea. Ashwin Tombat was there. Then I think it was Gurudas Savard whom I was interacting with. He said, there is one gentleman, Gajendra Uskampar, who is now a practicing advocate. He's, uh, Savard Bob said he is knowledgeable about his backward communities. He has done some research. So I approached uh, Uzgaonkar and he was very cooperative. He gave me access to all his data. He, he helped me with the data. And uh, we went out in the field as well. We went to various places where these communities were living. And I got to learn about Gosavis, Telis and Charis. So it was very exciting. That was one series. Then, uh, in Times of India, I did uh, quite a number of series on waste management, oil spill, and tar balls. That was one. That went on for, I think, 30 days. My other colleagues also, <laughs> also contributed to that. Vidya, Vidya is there, is right? And uh, I wrote about uh, springs and water issues. Yeah. See, one question many times with even like students or even otherwise people ask you are in this profession writing against. See, you have done so much daringly against illegal uh, uh, construction, <laughs> CRJ violation. Did you get threats any time? Uh, no, I don't remember getting any threats. But uh, the officials who used to give the information, they would not appreciate it. If there was criticism about some department, I could just, you know, say goodbye to that uh, department or that official. They would not open up again and give me information. And this is very difficult because Unless you get information from the department, the official version, it becomes difficult to come out with the story. And you end up by saying all my all the best efforts to contact the official could not bear fruit or something like that and finish up the story. So that is the problem. But when vital information is needed, even uh, this will not help. I mean, you have to kill the story. And uh, there was one occasion when one politician was really furious. Uh, I think it was the Kazan Land Board Bill that was passed in the House. And uh, it pertained to the Komdat Land because these uh, Kazan Lands are in Komdat Land. The land belongs to the Kondas and it is community land. So if the bill was passed and if, if it was implemented, the government would retain control of the land 
and even farmers would have had to pay for the water. So the Komininda traders were upset and I think they also criticized. So I remember I wrote a report about this, quoting all the Komindas, their representatives and leaders. And this politician in was criticizing me among my fellow reporters. I was not present and he was not appreciative of the report. After a few days, the bill was scrapped. But I don't know, it must be also criticism from other quarters. So this is the kind of situation it is. No, maybe knowing him, knowing his nature, who is giving that? I doubt <laughs> Yeah, one person which always comes to my mind, especially the youngsters who also want to know, is how are they are transition from typewriter to computers and, and now it is AI uh, era. So how is it? When I was working in the West Coast Times, uh, that time I was a proofreader. Our cubicle was on the ground floor, like where that part of the room is, and the linotype machines were being operated somewhere around this part of the room. And uh, the line, the composers compose the matter on the linotype. And it came out in slugs with the letters. And it came out uh, column by column. They took it column by column. They put, uh, they tied it up. They put it on uh, sort of a platform. Then they applied ink to it, black ink. They put a paper and rolled over it with a paper. And the column was printed on the paper. And it was brought to us for proofreading. We corrected the mistakes. And it was referred back to for correction. And that is how column by column the page was made. And that is how that system worked. When uh, regarding the this uh, typewriters, we were working with one typewriters typing our codes. It was a difficult job because we used to make mistakes. Sometimes we had to improve our reports. So we had to retype the whole thing again. And when computers came into the, I mean, into our domain, we were delighted. But quite often, or initially, what used to happen is we had typed a whole story on the screen. And after some time, we realized that the story has disappeared. <laughs> so we practically called the technician who came, who used to come running. I think this was the situation in the David times, because it coincided with my uh, joining the David times. I think there it started. Mid nineties. Mid nineties. Yeah. And. Uh, so back to work, typing the same story, or if lucky, the technician may have retrieved, retrieved it. What the, if we were lucky, the this technician would retrieve it, otherwise we had to type it all over again. But this was for a short time, I think technology improved, and uh, later on we were to uh, able to adapt to it and also it was more comfortable and user friendly. But about AI, I have no idea. I retired four years back, or at least in yeah, 2019. Yeah, I don't know much about that. I remember one comment that time something had to happen. The technician or the engineer would say, press F9, F10. I don't know what it meant. <laughs> For a long time it was very common. Yeah. Yeah. So next question, of, um, so you are one of the few journalists, probably the only one, I don't know, who worked for a company, Romy Script. No, no, there are. There are. Who so joined, no, 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 who joined uh, English newspaper. I don't remember. Ah, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are. There may be. Sanjeev worked for which paper? Sanjeev worked for Sunapran, then he joined the Marathi paper, Naukrabha, and I think there are many others. What about Raj? 
Raj worked for a good time. Ah, here is one prime example. He worked for Sunapra, Udari, and then Navinta. Swasini also. Yeah, not even Romani. Not even Romani. Not even Romani. Ah, Romani. So, Steve. Yeah, okay. So, no, my question has nothing to do with that. It's basically just to know, because within a short while, it folded up. There were some issues. Some difficulties which uh, now I am faced. Yeah. So since you were there, and uh, like we don't know the real story, what really happened. So it would be good if you could throw some light on it. Yeah, this was a very unique paper that came out. Uh, all the company lovers they gathered together and took out a padyatra all over Goa to collect funds. And they went on foot to all the villages. It took them, I think, quite a long time. I don't know, four months, six months, I don't remember. And uh, one of them in the forefront was, I think, Comrade Christopher Fonseca. I think recall with him. So finally, they collected the funds and started the paper in Margao. And uh, I joined it at a later stage, I think, 1985. That time, it had covered some ground. It had already, I think, uh, was in existence for about three years. But it was not doing well because the ad revenue was very poor. No ads were coming. The government also was not giving them ads. And uh, I remember Comrade Fonseca even took out a mocha in Tianjin, demanding that the government release ads to the paper. But, uh, you know, there was no response from the government. I think they gave some ads for some time. And, uh, but the paper was always in dire straits. Uh, Gauri's uncle, by the way, was working with me, Prasad Malkanekar. And we were always, uh, you know, in, in dire straits as far as our salaries were concerned. The 10th of every month was, you know, the date when they would disperse the salaries. But around, say, 20th of the month, they would call, call the staff and say, sorry, we'll give you 50% now and we'll let you know, we'll give you the rest later on. After 10 days, they would say, but at the end of the month, it wouldn't come. And the, by first, you know, somehow of the next month, they would get the money and release that part. And then you don't know when the next uh, salary would come. So this was the sorry state of affairs. The other working conditions were also bad. Uh, the management could not get good accommodation. There was uh, a small uh, house in which we were functioning. And the composing was, you know, uh, done with uh, it, is, it is hand composing. There was no machinery, and I remember there were two, three sub editors along with me who were working in a shed outside the that house. And if it rained, we would take all our things and we run inside. So for the company movement, it was when the paper folded up. It was a very bad setback for company movement because this paper had run for about four to five years but could not sustain itself and had to fold up. Many company lovers were very sad when the paper closed down. And this question I nothing with generally, but when I joined, uh, when I was a cop reporter, I heard in the press room, used to meet in the press room, uh, some journalists used to call him Paul John. Later on, some uh, editor of one paper used to call him John Paul. So I don't know why they used to call him. So could you just explain this? I think it was a Rico and other. Pope's influence. Uh, let, let's hear from. Yeah, yeah, I was confused with the Pope. <laughs> I used to. <laughs> I used to. Meaning, my byline was Paul Fernandez. I started uh, with that byline in Herald. 
Then one journalist friend told me, Are, that's a common name. And I found that there were at least two prominent namesakes. One employee in the, I think, one of the departments, government departments. So I took, um, uh, I mean, I, I thought I should change my name. And I changed it to Paul John. Yeah, Paul John Fernandez. So, but you know, it, it didn't catch on with the with my colleagues. They thought it was John Paul, or it was it was the editor himself who started calling me John Paul because he was confusing it with the Pope. So, and it stuck. And despite my telling them I'm Paul John, Paul or Jose Zuo, <laughs> they would not listen to me, or you know they preferred to call me John Paul, and it stuck there. And then I, I think I dropped the uh, this uh, Paul John Fernandez as a byline, and I reverted back to Paul Fernandez, and it has continued since. But if I met those old colleagues. They still call me John Paul. <laughs> and Rajan Narayan Paul John. Yeah, Rajan Narayan too. Okay, Paul, uh, could you tell us about your hobbies? You know that you are a very good footballer, as I mentioned. There is only one winner, what about others? You can play that. No, about, I'm, about I'm football also. say I'm, I'm football. a very good footballer. No, no, that you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, I, I would say I'm not a very good footballer, but I give my 100% when I'm on the field, I run around too much, I think, because one of the seniors commented, Are Damnakare, so Damnakare. So I think uh, sometimes it is not necessary. You have to take up the correct position. So, but I'm enthusiastic, and that is my mistake. But the thing is, I think I will have to cut down on football because I have lost quite a, you know, I think I lost 10 kg, not only because of football, but uh, there were problems, some health issues. And since then, I have not been able to gain the weight. So I think that has to do with football. <laughs> Strangely, I will have to reduce. <laughs> what about your other hobbies? Other hobbies. I used to play, I used to like volleyball and badminton, but I have not played much these two games. So it's mostly football, as Gons love fish, football and training in whatever order. <laughs> yeah, this I think Gauri will be able to add to it. Uh, whenever we used to have interns, and we used to send them to Paul. Yeah. Paul used to treat, like when you are a very senior person, like the treatment they normally get is different, but they used to all be surprised that Paul being so senior, is to treat them with a smile, guide them well. And would never, even if they had to make some mistake, would not go for press conference, he used to still be very calm and cool. And uh, would not get angry. So, <laughs> 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 So what is that which makes you, keeps you so cool now? Because generally, generally we have big egos now. He is the one guy who is quite grounded. What I would like to say is, when I began in the Herald, I think Rico had, uh, there, were, there was some problem, you know, he had, I think, uh, what you call, taken a break for some time, right? Is it right? Well, you know, I think he's had problems, so it's okay. <laughs> No, even from outside, Rico has been very encouraging. So, like that, when I joined Herald, uh, Norman Dantas, they were very helpful. I was very raw, and they helped me gain the requisite, or I learned the rudiments in the Herald. I went to Bromantek Times, there also, all those uh, seniors, Ashwin Tower, Sandesh, they were very encouraging. Navin Times, there also, I, I did well, and they were very encouraging. I was very lucky, I should say. In Times of India, of course, Rajiv Bora, Rajesh Menon, and Sri Nivas, they have been very encouraging, and you yourself, 
<laughs> so what I meant to say is, I should also give back something because otherwise I would, I, I don't know, it would have been difficult. And it is our duty to have this in terms because journalism is becoming, you know, I mean, in the sense, very few would like to take it up because of the stress, the work hours, the patience that you need. So it is our duty to make them comfortable and get more people into the field. So that's it. I think... Uh, I just want to make one mention. Mm -hmm. When I was just two, two or three years in the profession, nine times, mm -hmm. I was told to... I was given four bit. Suddenly, uh, and till then I had not uh, entered the presence of any court, high court, lower court. So I didn't know how to do it. So who saved me? Uh, Paul was the savior. He was already one of the uh, one of his bits of uh, court reporting. So I used to go with him, and other court reporters also used to be there. But he guided me. Actually. He showed me the nuances of court reporting. I think regarding court stories, no. Uh, I think Armenia was also covering it. She had just started covering, and but not when I. Uh, okay, okay. She yeah, was yeah. also doing the court. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, taking inspiration from her, I also started uh, doing it. But I think, I think more extensively, she got diverted to some other dish. I don't know, but. Uh, I used to uh, cover extensively, I used to get uh, environment stories, public interest litigations. That time Goa Foundation and some others were filing PILs. There were violations in CRZ. And because of tourism, there were more hotels. And these hotels were violating the rules while being built. Yeah. No, you are a like a model for many journalists. We just wanted to know from you what are the qualities of a good journalist. From my personal experience, I would say you should read more than you write. I think many people will say that. Experience people, experienced journalists will say that because you get that creative touch. I mean, creative uh, flair from it. Then you can increase your knowledge. Whereas, uh, if you don't read, uh, you know, even say news reports, you don't get the perspective. You have to have that background. You need to have that background to do good reports. So, reading, then you should have a nose for news. You should get the angle right. Or, you have to develop that sense of, like, what makes, what will make it, uh, you know, what will uh, appeal to the people or what sells, what will work. So that sense we have to get. And of course, you have to move around. If you go out in the field, you get more stories. What is your experience of coming out? Yeah, going out. I have been out with Raj on many trips. He himself knows. How exciting it is. You get to meet more, I mean, you make new new friends, you get new sources, you take down the numbers and it will serve you in good state next time. When something happens in that village, you can just call them. They are just a call away. And one, leads, one thing leads to another. You go there for one story, but you can get three, four stories. Somehow it comes out, you know, but you should know what is the story. So, if you develop that ability, it is very good because you, if it is interesting, you know, ah, this is another story. So, it automatically comes to you. So, these are the things. I think this is the Yeah, I have also gone a few times, <laughs> not too many times. But something uh, very nice I felt of Paul. Like even with Dori used to be there with us, sometimes Marcus. And we used to pick up Paul. 
sometimes some pillar of our <laughs> But you may be surprised to know like what will be the landmark for old tell us you come and search a place. You may think it's a marketplace, restaurant or a hotel, but not for the members. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> all, all related to tea. <laughs> Right, no? Yeah, actually, you know it was there. Because it's Kota Mention. Yeah, it is next to Kota Mention. Monday goes Kota Mention, and we were going, Murari was there, Murari is the witness to this, we are going, and Paul said, Chiche Kode yo. We are asking everybody, Chiche Kode, Chiche Kode, Kode, Chiche Kode, and everybody is like, ah, it's the English style, it's the English style, but but finally, when we reached, we got fight it only. And Maggie Paul, I love. Are And Taja Buka, and you only put a mention. And Paul is saying, Chiche, Paul, you could have said, I got a mention. And one more thing I want to add about Paul's love for football. 12 years, 13 years, I worked regularly with Paul. In the newsroom, actually, tempers fly high, but uh, Paul is like um, always calm, cool in the newsroom. But when you, if you have to see Paul angry, you have to play football with him. <laughs> there was an internal uh, football tournament, and uh, Paul was disputing your ball <laughs> with Marcus. <laughs> Paul, Paul just would have let it go. Till the time we went to office, Paul was like on and on and on. He's just still disputing the word. I think the last thing about this Chiche Kode, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with uh, what you say. My preference, that whole landmark is called Chiche Kode by the way. It's not only me. And Kota mentioned it's not me. It's true. Uh, it's true, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, then, this reminds me of another piece which you told me once, you know. Uh, I think you also asked me to do it because uh, I think you had heard about some some landmark in Salset, Javsara Swambo or something like that. So I thought uh, taking up Gauri's idea, I will do that piece. And luckily along the route from Karmana to Margaon, Karmana is my village and Newton is around, yeah. <laughs> so there were a number of such landmarks, all amusing. One is Kumangadi, toilet gadi. <laughs> so uh, the thing is, uh, there was a toilet over there during the pre Portuguese era, and after I think liberation, it was converted into a, uh, this uh, bar. And so people called it Kumangadi. Kuma is Kumau is in Kokni is toilet. Then I think somewhere a little further there was Devsara Tsuambo. It was a very haunted place. And the entire people I mean the entire villages, all the people along the big villages they knew that this was the haunted village I mean the Ambo. And they used to you know, feel afraid when they reach that place. And at night it was avoided like anything. But that was the only road through that, uh, through the village, only village, to go further to Kavilo Singh. It is said that some ghosts have been seen, been seen there. Then there was one place called Voltar. Voltar in Portuguese, I think yeah. now it's become a company word. Voltar is a turn. So in Benaulin there is a junction, one road takes you to Kolwa and one to Margaon. So that is another landmark and there was one Boga wine. It's in there used to be dances being held there next to the well. And it is by the roadside in Benaulin. So a lot of love marriages took place there it seems. I mean after the dances, so that name got stuck. So this is all about place names. Sorry. Riko is from Volta also. Ah, is from Volta. Riko is from Kalyanso Gaon. Foxes. <laughs> <laughs> but.
But there are no foxes now. No? Sorry, I must be boring you. <laughs> Actually, it must be me asking from silly questions. <laughs> so, okay, I'll end with the last question. What is your advice to young journalists? Oh, uh, yeah, before this, we can throw the door open. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. So, can yes. stop yeah. at the end. Yeah. 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 No, I think I have not said enough about the environment somewhere. I think we missed one question. Uh, Goa's environment is now very vulnerable and I think young writers have to take this up. As you are aware, the rules have been tweaked. You know about the 39A, section 39A. So, and on the other hand, there are extreme weather events taking place more closely now than ever before. And there are enough warnings, but despite that, the government has not taken it. It is our job to, you know, awaken the government, sound the alarm, and also create awareness, because some disastrous things are being projected, and they are likely to happen. One is Tiswadi will be flooded by, I mean, lot of low-lying areas will be flooded, by 2030, then there are going to be heat waves. So, as far as possible, we have to do our job. The young uh, writers or the journalists have to take up the gauntlet and start uh, doing these stories. I know they are doing it, but they should do more of these stories. Yeah. For this, uh, to add to what you said, mm. the politics of reporting the environment. See, in the first case, environment stories are slow moving, so it's very hard to tell. Secondly, there was a cutoff point after liberalization when politics suddenly became unwelcome. I don't know, I felt it. Because all uh, environment pages closed down for economic reasons. Thirdly, and the most important point, you almost said it, you know, where, see, the systems have broken down. Academia, which is supposed to produce critical knowledge is stopped doing it mm. by and large. And then we don't have a feeder channel. And this is also because of the politics of different situations. Now politicians are there, they have a stake in the issue, a huge stake in the issue. And they are making sure that this doesn't happen. Where is autonomy in education? That's gone. So I'm saying like, you know, how do we get a holistic picture of the food thing? It's, it's, it's a big struggle. There was a time when the environment suddenly became, uh, you know, an issue of interest. But now it's on the back burner. People feel it from the grassroots up. But I don't think there's a push from top, like, you know, say, journalism institutes to teach environment, to come out with the environmental guides, to have seminars, which was there once upon a time. These are just some thoughts which are inspired by what you said. Uh, you meant to say um, conferences on environment then training programs all have all dried up, no? Dried up, or even, mm -hmm. even yeah, from that space is gone. Mm -hmm. That space is reduced. Now it's coming up because of the people dem people's demand. That's a different thing. Yeah. There's competition, we know it sells. Mm -hmm. That's a different push. No, I also feel that uh, research in environment also, science, it's drying up. I think you will agree with me. So, and on the other hand, as you know, a uh, lot of uh, projects at central level, they do not uh, take, I mean, they are not uh, fashioned in a way to minimize the damage. So, you know, it's a bit insensitive on the part of the government to uh, not consider the environment because environment, uh, you know, it's a resource, you know. All the natural resources are there, and we are and they are shrinking because of this. Okay, throw your questions to Paul. Any, anything, any simple, complex, whatever. Please don't ask tough questions <laughs> because I'm not an expert. I'll answer whatever I can. Yeah, I yeah. tell you when. When I write anything about, like, you know, I feel that I have learned this reporting about 
what do you say? Empathizing with your subject, like the way you write about turtles, you know, you say few bird friends, or you know, you uh, kind of generates an empathy for the subject, or uh, these things that you uh, pick up, like some trivia sort of, no, like you just explained. Kuma uh, Gadi and those type of things or how origins of name happened or those kind of things which are not uh, very obvious stories. So when I think of uh, those kind of stories, I learned it from you to write like stories which are not obvious or hard hitting stories uh, or features. So uh, like it's very unusual to find that kind of uh, story space kind of like you know. so. Is there anyone that you uh, gained that idea from like uh, these kind of offbeat kind of stories? Any particular? I think uh, it's, a, it's a gift from God, nature, whatever you call it. Because uh, when I had not joined journalism, I remember uh, somewhere in 19, mid 70s, I think. And uh, yeah, West Coast Times was, uh, you know, had been launched that time, but I was not in West Coast Times that time. It so happened, you know, in our village. Uh, the next day was the feast. And some villagers, including my father, they tried to catch a pig. But the pig was a very unusual one. He escaped, they could not catch him. Or they caught him, but he somehow escaped and it ran some five kilometers from Carmona. It ran towards the church and crossed the river and went to the other side. So, uh, my, uh, my father and the other villagers chased it because they wanted something for the fish next day. But uh, the pig ran ahead. They caught the ferry, but uh, by the time they reached there, the peak had reached somewhere else, God knows where. And they lost, and they came back. So I thought this was a very interesting story. And I went and wrote uh, some points and gave it to Valmiki Palero. He polished it very nicely, and it was carried in the uh, West Coast Times. Yeah. Then, I worked as a correspondent for Navin Times when Mudalyar was there. And some very interesting things used to happen. I think uh, one hen had laid very unusual eggs. They were the size of uh, grapes. <laughs> what is that? I think uh, Anab Shahi. I don't know what is Anab Shahi grapes. Yeah, the story came out like that. I didn't say Anab Shahi in my report, but uh, whoever edited that report said Anab Shahi grapes. I think they were slightly bigger or something. So, no, no, they were small eggs. Yeah, yeah, small eggs, not bigger, bigger not outside. They were small eggs. So, all these uh, you know, unusual things used to interest me. And that is how it, that interest developed. And I got that flair for uh, these uh, offbeat stories. Yeah. Picking up the unusual, because even uh, Suresh Naik from Kurchure uh, was an expert at this. Yeah. But he wrote a similar column on how uh, two snakes were fighting or meeting in the middle of the road and there was traffic jams on both sides. Yeah. Then got a front page call. Uh, Norman also used to, uh, yeah, Norman he used to encourage these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, correct. Norman yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You also mentioned about water sport. Ah, water sport. Water sport you mentioned. Yeah. A lot of stories of weather. <coughs> yes, there was, I think, a video circulating somewhere, and I thought it would make a good story. But without Dr. Ramesh Kumar, I have to give credit to him. He's like a faculty member, <laughs> always very cooperative. So that is how all uh, the other stories come out. Hailstones also, hailstones also came out of Shirada, hailstones in Shirada. Hailstones. Yeah, that is one climate change kind of thing, no? Uh, as you said, hailstones cannot occur during winter, no? But uh, in that particular instance, there were hailstones, I think in uh, February? Which year? Uh, about two years back. Yeah, two years back, 22, I think, 22. Yeah. 
lot of weather stories, in unusual weather stories they wrote. <laughs> but you have been the expert who has been helping us. Uh, yeah, you have worked with uh, normal classes and you have worked with Ashwin Tomba. Both of them well known for covering environmental stories. Uh, what would you have gained from these two different perspectives? Uh, yeah, when I worked with the Norman Dutters, I won't remember now my memory is started fading. But uh, I remember he used to do uh, cover up all these uh, violations, then controversial projects. So uh, it did inspire me. Ashwin also used to do some, meaning I think he has not written uh, stories as much, but he used to cover it in his column, Tomcat, I think, you know, Tomcat, yeah. In a very witty way, he used to present uh, these environmental issues in that, and even uh, routine things. So, they did uh, help me, I mean, Working with them helped me do environmental stories. I'm sorry, my oratory is not so good. Please bear with me. No, but I'm that piece, in... that piece you wrote on Nova Goa. Yeah. As Ashwin used to himself say, a journalist's job is not to stand and talk, but to sit and write. And in keeping with that motto, I think uh, you know many of us write better than we talk. Your piece on Nobe Goen, okay, which yeah. you did for that book we put together in black and white. Black and white. It's quite a classic piece. It's floating around on the internet. If you Google for Paul Fernandez and Nobe Goen, I think Paul called it Nobe Goen, the roof caves in. The roof caves in. And he describes from the from from the Padyatra where people walked on hundred days Padyatra or something. And uh, which he mentioned that you know they were, they collected a lack of rupees, which was quite idealistic in those days. Crowd crowdfunding, the lack of rupees. It was, was a lot lack of, money. of rupees. No, I don't yeah. know the amount. You mentioned the lack of rupees. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of money, mm -hmm. but somehow keeping it together was a challenge. And I think maybe journalists should look in terms of media alternatives even today. It's not too late in the day. Mm -hmm. But that piece is a classic, you know. I think because it captures that slice of history. Thank you. Paul, tell us something about your family. Do you think you have lived up to the expectation or you could have done something more? Or exceeded? Yeah. Or have, have they ever protested against your profession? They all protested. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Or, or were they very supportive? Um, no, my wife has been supportive, but uh, quite often she used to feel the, you know, pinch because she had to do all the running around. And now all this has come to after retirement. come to haunt me. Like, it is like with revenge. <laughs> but as Mario Kabran used to say, journalists and donkeys never retire. And I think we should keep that spirit, you know, because retirement is something that makes you feel old. Yeah, okay. Sir, sir. Uh, Paul, yeah, uh, it's an account that you have worked with any other journalist. Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear. It's an account that you have worked with any other journalist any time? Uh, no, 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 no. Is there some In what sense you are saying? Meaning, could be uh, uh, a sense type of, of story. A sense of competition uh, could be on those lines. Such a matter. Yeah, not just competition, like I said, you have not done enough in this field. Ah, that way. Okay. Like no, I said in what sense. Uh, there are a lot of things happening and I am not able to cover all these things. Uh, we have our limitations. So, oh, no. in that sense, I What think. do I want to say is, let me come in as a supposedly neutral bystander. I think. <laughs> Paul is not, see the default in journalism is political journalism. If you are growing up in life, you have to move towards politics. But Paul has been going off on a tangent and, and proudly so. 
whether it's environment heritage, I think his contribution to heritage is far more than environment. You know, and, and uh, he has carved a niche for himself in that sense. Right? I don't think anyone has, has covered these issues so consistently and for so long, you know. Of course, everyone has their feet. Gaudi has done education, <coughs> and the others have specialized. But in terms of heritage, I, I, I don't see anyone who has done so much. No, because these are niche issues, it's very easy to overlook them. Everyone is dancing after politics. Need to look at the, you know, yeah, in the, I think you know, uh, reporters have to be encouraged. What I feel is, as I said, because newspaper incomes are limited, no. Uh, you only employ X number of reporters. They have to do everything. They have to cover routine. I am lucky, I think, because. I got to do exclusive stories and whereas my colleagues were slogging in the field. No, 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 Paul, but you also pushed for it. See, no one asked you, the, all the papers you worked for didn't tell you do heritage. You pushed for it because it was your passion. So I think it should come from the journalists themselves. The, the managements are not likely to say, oh, they are getting good stories if you are using your time well. If you give the, your paper an edge over the competition. Right. It's, it's on you also. The onus is on you as an individual. Yeah, I think it is my love for nature okay. and even heritage. Why heritage? Why heritage? How did heritage come about? In it your is, case? It is like natural heritage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean man-made heritage. Sorry, man-made heritage. <laughs> like, <coughs> take the place like uh, Old Goa. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And if you look around, you feel disgusted because the neglect is so much. Successive governments have neglected Old Goa. It's really painful to see. Garages are very close to some monument. Restaurants have come up here, uh, world-class monuments. So it's a sad state of affairs. I think writers should take up these issues. That's why I say I'm lucky. I was not, you know, pushed to do those, uh, to do the political stories. That's why I say I'm lucky. And I don't like politics much. That also was a factor. And I didn't have political acumen, like say Murari has, or even this uh, Vital Da Segre. Julio de Silva, all these fellows had some political acumen. They knew how to get political stories. I didn't have that neck at all in politics. And if you had to contest the election, you would have lost? I would have lost. Lost my deposit as well. Sorry, sorry. I said, but this knowledge in politics is better than most political experiences. Sorry? Your knowledge in politics is better than most political reporters. I don't know. <laughs> you have a perspective, I think, because I, I, I don't yeah, know. I'm speaking from my experience of running. Oh, really? I, I, this is a surprise to me. <laughs> I mean, it is. It relates to our food security, you know. And now it is under threat. Uh, we get everything from Belgaum and other adjoining areas. What are we producing? That's very little. It's good that you know there are initiatives now. People like Miguel, they are encouraging. And, but uh, it has to be. A, collective effort. 
I think our bones um, to think more seriously about this. But the problem is what? And this will be a problem of the climate change. All the fields will get flooded. Uh, as you can see, I'll give you one example. This uh, area from Chimbal, Mercedes, and Santa Cruz, and this side to Talegaon. Uh, in the year 19, 1888, I used to travel by bus to Harald of Since 1988. I used to see the from uh, Baboli bypass, Kalapura, that side. That full thing was open. It was an uh, expanse of fields. And when they, when it was time for harvesting, it uh, turned into a very golden brown hue. But now, if you see, it's all covered with mangroves. So this is because we, I mean, neglected agriculture due to various reasons. There was the problem of uh, labor imports, rise in labor imports, and everybody abandoned agriculture. So uh, uh, the, the problem is what, because of uh, part of being constructed, it, that whole uh, row of buildings and bus stand, that was a field earlier. That led to the displacement of water, huge quantities of water. And now, can you see some places permanently flooded? They are permanently flooded. That is because of the displacement of water. What will happen in future is when this Kadamba plateau is stripped of all the greenery, the runoffs will increase and the area of submergence which you see now, that will also increase. In this connection, I would like to ask Marcos because you live in that Band area, no? Below the, uh, that Bondwal uh, lake, that area was never flooded, am I right? Recently I passed that side. That area seemed to be like a permanently flooded area. In summer, I don't know, but at least part of it gets permanently flooded, no? Yeah, especially in the flooded. Yeah. So like this, the areas of permanent, uh, this permanent water logging will increase and agriculture will have to be ruled out because uh, it, it won't be possible to grow anything in this area. And the projection of ISRO, in, uh, they say in 2030, uh, all these low-lying areas will go totally underwater. And I think even roads will be underwater, so it's going to be a big problem. And areas of agriculture, will, the cultivable areas will decrease. Or do you remember during our working days, did you see me getting agitated? Because my memory is getting, you know, my memory is fading now. These brains have been taxed too much, I think. <laughs> Don't remember.
they were greeting for like oh thank you very much <laughs> please let us know we will be more than happy to so, help you so what was that you know what did you do to them what did you do to them like what did you do to them what did you do to them what did you do to them Uh, that architect was that for because uh, you know he he did something that we recall he altered the you know something around the monument that is the fort they had to do some amendment to do that which they didn't do i think the government later on did something to correct that uh, so he was angry about it and then uh, i carried a clarification about that and he was happy and i, I gave more information about the whole subject so he was happy about it yeah. 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 <laughs> panchayat the leaders no yes. that they had not taken action against them and i think franky being a nature lover he yeah. <laughs> forgot, <laughs> forgot that he was a journalist <laughs> and started <laughs> going at the hammer and tongs tongs and uh, excited about seeing the natural cave and it is a cave made by due to weathering by the sea uh, this tidal conditions and the water comes right inside it's really a sight worth seeing and there are beds lying around it looks a bit uh, you know weird kind of place adventure, but adventure. <laughs> sorry adventure yeah, yeah it was quite an adventure There was one guide with us, no? Ah, uh, 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 Size of this huge thing. So many stories there. 
Are there any stories that you remember? Uh, no, it's still old, very dear to you. Not from an activism point of view, from the pure pleasure of doing a story which nobody thought of. Sir. Yeah, generally these uh, stories related to natural elements, they are the ones I feel satisfied about doing. Out of the blue, I, uh, there was a finding about uh, shellfish in Kelosin. They, they look like chocolates. The color and the, you know, the texture, it, I thought it looked like a chocolate. Rajesh, I think, was around no, that time. Yeah, it was It was carried on the front page as an entropies. If you had to do a book, what would it be on? Like, what would it be on? As a state. Yeah, I am asked this question. Uh, Raj, for instance, occasionally asks me, when are you writing a book? So what's your answer? But sad to say, I have uh, you know exhausted my patience, <laughs> <laughs> and I am not thinking of writing a book as such. I think Frederick sir can help all in this. I think Everyone that could be the people. most positive outcome of this session. Everyone has a book in their mind, not saying yeah. because I am in the trade, but you know I think there are stories to tell. And we are looking at a ghost writer. But what I advise is don't put compiled uh, papers together, though I have done it myself, compiled mm -hmm. articles. That's the worst option. Okay. It's a hurried option, but it doesn't work. Okay. I've done it myself. doesn't work. Because the time has passed. Now, unless you can explain the context, okay. even that works. Go beyond what is written and add to it. Add to it to explain the context, because the situation has changed. Timbley did it quite well recently. Mm -hmm. Sorry, who did? Prabhakar Timbley. Ah, Timbley, okay. But he's given the From context. His column, yeah, 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 his column. Okay. Newspaper writing doesn't stand the test for so long. Mostly, mostly. Mm -hmm. It's better you take your first trip of being a novelist. Mm -hmm. Paul always wanted to be a novelist. Mm -hmm. so, okay. I don't think I have the... What shall we say? I won't be able to write a novel at this stage. No, but there's too much writing in the world of fiction happening in Goa, Kokni, Marathi especially. Who will produce the ideas in non-fiction? Which is harder work but more useful from a societal point of view. I think. Tell me if I'm wrong. Even translations, for example, with your multilingual skills or something, but knowledge, getting knowledge in the market. Useful knowledge. Sorry. You can think of writing in Kokani. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, I mean, that's a good question actually. I feel pain that I have devoted so much time to writing and work on the environment. And I wanted to write in Kokani, but I'm sorry, I have done nothing. I really feel sad. You can do that now. It's your time. I had been to Kochi, where there are a lot of bones who had migrated. Kumni is picking uh, bones who had migrated there. Then uh, there are areas in Karnataka where there are Kumni speaking people. So these are very interesting things. And Kumni, there are a lot of things which could be written, but uh, it's so sad I don't get time to. I don't know, meaning, I have not. I don't get time to write in Kumbhi. Even for Gulab, I feel sorry. I don't get time to write for Gulab or Atikamis. I could write uh, something on the environment for them, but there's no time. I'm sorry if I have bored you, I'm not a good speaker. So thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Vijay. That was really motivational session, and I think of course this is a you know session to motivate and to get motivated. And thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vijay. It was really you know inspiring and you know highly educating also. Thank you very much. Uh, well, friends, uh, we have made small bookmarks here, and I think everyone must have got. So if you if you are, if you want, and I would really request you to kindly get it signed from Paul and keep it as a you know oh my God. as a you know <laughs> as a wonderful memory of this session, and which we are going to you know do it for the next sessions also. We started with Paul, and it will continue. Do it. I would like to especially thank, uh, you know, I would like to acknowledge few people here who have come specially, you know, not for nothing else but for the love of, you know, Paul. Uh, first of all, uh, let me acknowledge the presence of Times of India editor Rajesh Menon. Okay. Then, uh, you know, we have Pranitha Sir is there. Then, our very own scientist, Mr. Ramesh Kumar is there. Mr. Madhu Gamkar. Yeah, Madhu Gamkar. He is an environmentalist from. From Kandola, no? Yeah. Then Gangaram Mamre sir is there. Then Sari Corona, of course. He is a regular, you know, attendee of this. Roland Martin sir. Yeah, Roland Martin. Yeah, I think he left. He left, he left. Yeah. Billy Goya sir, principal of our college of art. Then Abhi Pogre is here. Then staff of Naveen Times. And Marcus. Of course, Murari is there. And and some young, young enthusiasts also there. <laughs> okay, but they are in their own world. Okay. Can I, can I? So, yeah, please. Can I just give us yeah, yeah. a small gift to Paul and my gentleman? Thank you. So, uh, once again, I would like to thank one and all for you know, taking out time and attending the session. I would like to request all of you to please continue attending this session. Because it is going to be really enriching, like as we you know uh, march on this journey of behind the byline. So uh, we are almost at the end of the session, and before we end, I would like to call all all friends. Big sign, big sign, like, big sign, big sign, big, you know, not small. small, small uh, I should be able to forge it. Uh, I should be able to forge yeah, it. <laughs> Look, this call. Doctor, doctor, one second. My, my signature is very big one, simple. Big one, big one, big one. My signature is so very simple. So that I can forge it someday. Bank, bank, a bank signature.